So for no particular reason, we'll start with um, trying to graph um, sine of x today first, and then we'll look at cosine of x. Okay? They're very similar to one another, um, which kind of makes sense because you know if you think about the inputs, right? So the inputs, what we plug into cosine and sine, of course, and tangent, all the other trig ratios. We'll worry about tangent and all the other trig functions um, on a later at a later date, but right now we'll just focus on sine and cosine. Um, but if you think about the inputs, what are the what are the kinds of things we plug into a trig function? What are the inputs typically? We always take sine of what kind of things or cosine of what kind of things? Angles, yeah, okay. Either in degrees or radians. Okay. And so we will um we will be doing it in radians, okay, and not degrees. We'll be using radians here again, which again is why it's important to kind of have those ratios down. Okay. <clears throat> to have those ratios down, be able to come up with the answers and stuff like that pretty quickly, right? <clears throat> All right, so um, let's start with um, y equal to the sine of x. Okay, so no longer theta in there, it's sine of x, right? But that kind of gives us, again, <clears throat> You know, an x and a y coordinate here. Okay. Now the x and y here are going to be slightly different than the x and y relationship that we talk about on the unit circle. <clears throat> okay. Remember that on the unit circle, um, kind of like the input on the unit circle is an angle, and that's how far you rotate around the unit circle. Okay. So in that location of the unit circle, that angle right finds the location of the unit circle which is then also in the coordinate plane. So we're kind of like rotating first and then locating an x and y coordinate. Here, here what we're going to do is we're just going to plug in that angle, okay? But now it's an x value. So instead of like rotating around that much, think about the x value, right? x values go left and right. So we're going to go, you know, left or right from the origin, that x amount of x, right? And then the corresponding y value, the output when you take sine of x, that corresponding y value will then give us the, um, the height of the point. Okay, so in a certain sense, we're going to be like, well, I don't know, unwinding the unit circle in, in a little way to think about it maybe. So um, we'll keep things here kind of positive. So I will start me putting my y-axis right here. Okay, and um, when it comes to our y-axis here, thinking about things, right? What is what's the highest value? What's the highest output that we've seen sine have? with our unit circle. The highest going to be is what? One. One, yeah, OK. And so we don't need to go very far on our range here. The highest we're going to go is 1. So I'll put like 1 right there. And what's the lowest y value we've seen sine output? Negative. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, lower than 0 even. Yeah, very good. Negative 1. OK. <coughs> so we're going to be between, seemingly, negative 1 and 1 here, right? All right. And then, well, again, for our x values, we typically choose our angles, right? Typically, our angles are between 0 and 2 pi. So let's go ahead and maybe we'll say, OK, we're going to start at 0. We're going to go all the way out to 2 pi. So I'm going to say maybe 2 pi is like right here, like that. <clears throat> OK? Now, let's just come up with some values here, right? We'll just kind of think of like almost like a, a mental table. We'll do like a table in our head. Right? So for example, let's say I wanted to find sine of 0. What is sine of 0? Sine of 0 is 0. Okay? So we have a point at 0, 0. Okay? When I plug in the angle of 0, okay, I'm 0 away from the origin. And then the y value, the output, the height off the, or off the x axis there is going to be 0. Okay? Uh, let's do another one here. What about 2 pi? What's sine of 2 pi? 0, 0, OK, 0 as well for sine. OK, so we have zero, 2 pi comma 0 as well. Okay, no big deal there. Let's come up with some other kind of easy ones here. Let's maybe do like, um, let's go halfway between 0 and 2 pi, which is pi. OK, what's sine of pi? Zero. All right, this is getting kind of boring here, isn't it? Because you just got a lot. Of, some of you guys are like, what's new, Mr. Wade? This is pre-cal. It's always boring, right? But, but OK, it's extra not interesting because you have like seemingly this flat line. So maybe you can come up with some more points, right? So all right, let's try the pi over 2 and the 3 pi over 2. That might make things a little more interesting here. Um, what's sine of pi over 2? 
one. Ah, positive one. Here, maybe we have something more interesting happening now. Okay. And what about uh, sine of three pi two? Negative one. Ah, okay. A little more interesting, right? <coughs> so now we're going to connect the dots. If we were to connect the dots now, it would no longer be flat like we have those original three points. But now it looks like we're going to go up, and then down, and then down, and then back up. So what kind of shape it looks like we're forming here? A wave. A wave. A wave. Okay, and in fact, that is what we're forming. Okay, if you don't believe me, we'll really briefly you know, consider the points between 0 and pi over 2. So for example, I'll throw in here like pi over 6. I'm going to like squeeze it in here. Okay. Um, what is sine of pi over 6? 1 half, right? So that's pretty easy to graph. We'll just go halfway up here, right? Sine of pi over 6, 1 half. So something like right there. Okay. The next two are not quite as easy to graph. So for example, like pi over 4. What's pi over 4? Sine of pi over 4, sorry? Yeah, root 2 over 2. Anyone know what that decimal is? <laughs> yeah, off the top of your head? Yeah, probably not, right? Let me give it to you. It's um, 0.7. Oh, 0.707. Okay, so we're a little bit higher. Pi over 4, a little bit higher. Okay, not quite 3 fourths, though. That would be 0.75 or like 0.7. So maybe just a little bit less than 3 fourths. Okay, and then pi over 3, our final one there. Okay, well, what's sine of pi over 3? Root 3 over 2, which as a decimal, 0.86. So close to 0.9. So again, a little bit higher still. Okay, and so we can kind of see this shape taking form here, right? So if I kind of connect these from 0, okay, we have this kind of shape happening, right? Now, we know we're not going to continue to increase here because as we, as we move from pi over 2 to pi, well, we're going to have to go back down from 1 to 0 here. And in fact, if you remember, right, sine at 2 pi over 3 is also root 3 over 2. Sine at, so at 2 pi over 3, which would be like roughly right there, and then sine at 3 pi over 4 is also positive root 2 over 2, so like right there. So we're basically just going to like have some symmetry right here. And then sine of 5 pi over 6 is also uh, 1 half. So again, like back down to there. And so we're going to look something like that. So it should be symmetric, essentially. From 0 to pi, it should be kind of a vertical line symmetry. Okay. But then, of course, between pi and 3 pi over 2, well, what quadrant, what quadrant are we talking about when we talk about between pi and 3 pi over 2 on the unit circle? What quadrant is between pi and 3 pi over 2? Quadrant 3. And, why, and sine pi is negative there. Yeah. Sine is negative there, right? And so we're going to see, we're going to go down, having those negative values like that. Okay. And then in quadrant 4, which on the unit circle is between you know, 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi, okay, we'll have, again, negative sine values. And we're going to go right back up like this. Okay. <clears throat> but of course, was our domain limited here with sine? Did we limit our domain at all? No, we did not. And so sine continues. In fact, let's go ahead and do another, um, another, or let's continue our sine here. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to continue here. All right, 0 to 2 pi. All right, and then we'll go out another 2 pi here. So we get 4 pi. So what does it look like is going to happen at the end here at 2 pi? What does it look like is going to happen? It's going to repeat. Exactly right. OK, we're going to have a repeat. Yeah. We're going to see this wave-like behavior. First, like a third of the first two, two days. Oh, the next two days. Gotcha. OK. Thank you. All right. So you're right. So let's go ahead and find, then, the midpoint here between 2 pi and 4 pi. That'll be 3 pi. Okay, and then I'll also find the quarter points. So halfway between 2 pi and 3 pi will be 5 pi over 2. And halfway between 3 pi and 4 pi, 7 pi over 2. Okay. Again, how do I find those midpoints? I just add up the two endpoints and divide it by 2. So 2 pi plus 3 pi is 5 pi, divided by 2 is 5 pi over 2. 3 pi plus 4 pi is 7 pi, divided by 2, 7 pi over 2. Okay. And so we can kind of imagine here, 2 pi kind of corresponds to 0. So then 5 pi over 2 will correspond to pi over 2, right? They're coterminal. And so this will also give us a positive 1 here. 3 pi corresponds to pi. Again, they're coterminal, right? You just subtract 2 pi, you're back at pi. So again, 
there's that. 7 pi over 2 is coterminal of 3 pi over 2, so it'll be at negative 1. And then 4 pi is coterminal of 2 pi, so we'll be back at 0. And so you can see the wave is exactly repeated there. OK, and if you like, you can kind of like draw a dotted line there. And of course, you can also go in the negative direction, too. I didn't even show you that, right? But we could go in the opposite direction here, too, left and right. <coughs> So what is the domain of sine? What's the domain of sine? Yeah, the domain is all real numbers, right? You can plug any old number you want in there. OK, there's no problems. OK, no problems. All right, of course, you plug in a number like 2, and that might, in your head, you might be like, I have no idea how to evaluate this, right? We pick very specific values here that help us to evaluate sine mentally. Right? You could put, you could, you can evaluate sine of two, right? You can evaluate sine of two, but you're gonna be like, mm, not, not sure how to do that, right? <coughs> <coughs> what about the range? What's the range for sine? What does it look like it's gonna be? Yeah, negative one to one, right? And we include those. Okay. <coughs> so what would you say the end behavior is here? What would you say here? For example, as x approaches infinity, uh, we'll say, you know, f of x approaches what? What would we say it approaches as we approach infinity here? One and negative one and yeah, zero, every number in between. So we can't really describe the end behavior of sine. <coughs> okay? So in other words, the limit as x approaches infinity of the sine of x does not exist. OK? The limit does not exist because it doesn't go to a single value, right? It's limited, right? The, the, so we know that, for example, it definitely, we, you, like 2 is impossible, right, which is sine of x, right? But we don't, what, so we don't have a single value that approaches. So we say the limit does not exist for sine. It just keeps going. Same thing with going to negative infinity. <coughs> okay, so the end behavior is kind of hard to describe, except we know it's limited between negative one and one. So that's about it. Okay, so um, what we've graphed here, all right, is two full periods of sine. All right, if you like know like your physics and stuff like that, right? If you've talked about waves and stuff in physics, okay, do you guys do that? Yeah, talk about waves and things. Okay, so you talk about the period or how often a um, wave you know repeats and stuff like that and so that is you know you can say like one period two periods and stuff like that <coughs> the cyclical things okay so how long is the period of a sine graph what is the period length here pi. 2 pi right we go from 0 to 2 pi here we go from 2 pi to 4 pi that length is 2 pi as well okay so sometimes, and again, the word period can refer, sometimes it refers to the length of the period, and sometimes it refers to just the interval. Okay, so just keep that in mind. They, it, that word period kind of uses, has two uses when we're talking about trade. When we're talking about the length of the period, you know, how long it is, or also just the interval itself. So like, in other words, between 0 and 2 pi, or between 2 pi and 4 pi. Okay, two ways to think about it there. <coughs> okay, so why don't you guys go ahead and try and graph y equals cosine of x, OK? y equals cosine of x. And I'm going to try and do it over two full periods as well. here. I'm also going to graph my y-axis so that it kind of lines up with sine as well. OK, so I'm going to try and use the same kind of points here. Um, and I'll kind of get you started as well. What's the highest value that cosine is going to you know, give us? One, right? So we also can just put a height of one there. And then, of course, what's the lowest value? Negative, Negative one. Very good. OK, and so I'm just going to kind of line these things up here. So I already lined up my zeros, but I'll go ahead and line up like the pi here, just so you can kind of compare them a little bit. And the two pi, I'll line those up. And I am going to do, well, I'll let you just do one full period here for right now. OK, so go ahead and just do one full period of cosine. Use what you know about the unit circle to help you out there.
again, think about what is cosine of zero? Cosine of zero is, and then plot that point, right? What's cosine of pi over two? Cosine of pi over two is, and then plot that point. Cosine of pi over two. And then connect the dots. One more minute here, one more minute. So your section of graph should look something like this. Section of cosine. Okay. <clears throat> so cosine of zero is one, right? Cosine of pi over two, zero. Cosine of pi negative one. Cosine of three pi over two, zero. Cosine of two pi, one. Okay. So what kind of shape is cosine? It's a wave, it's a wave as well, right? Okay. Is it the same kind of wave as sine? Yeah, it's just moved over. Yeah, it's just moved over. Okay, it's very observant. Exactly right. Can you say how much it's moved over by? Yeah, it's moved over by um, uh, pi halves. Pi halves, exactly right. It is a shift of pi halves, okay? Shift of pi halves, exactly right. Um, and so, uh, and which kind of makes sense, again, because if you remember pi over, I mean, there's like some relationship there, right? Because um, Cosine is called cosine not for the prefix co, but it's actually short for complement of sine, right? So if you remember, like we talked about, I just briefly mentioned this, but you also saw it in geometry. You know, sine of um, a certain angle, let's say sine of 20 degrees, that's equal to the cosine of 70 degrees, okay? Sine of one angle is equal to the cosine of its complement, okay? And so sine and cosine are related um, by kind of comp being complementary to each other in some sort of sense. So yeah, this would be the shift of pi over two. Okay. Do the well cosine, I guess if you shift sine to the left pi over two, then you get the left side. So I guess we shift sine <coughs> to the we shift sine to the left, yeah, or cosine to the right pi over two. So shift cosine right pi over two, you got sine. Shift sine left pi over two, you got cosine. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. So all the same behavior stuff kind of still applies here, right? So the domain would still be what? All real numbers. The range would be what? Negative one to one, inclusive. Okay. And uh, again, that end behavior, right? The limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity of cosine. Well, it's again not going to exist. We don't really have like a finite end behavior there. Well, it's finite, but it's not quite like an a simple value, right? So it's finite, and that's limited between negative one and one, but it still doesn't exist because it's constantly oscillating between negative one and one. Okay? And of course you could extend this, you know, and stuff like that if you wanted to. So we could do, you know, like the five pi well, we could extend out another full period here. Let me actually back up here. What is the period length for cosine here? Let me go back to that. What's the length of our period here? Two pi again, right? So again we have another you know period that is two pi in length. I guess I can say that up here too. Okay, so it repeats every two pi, right? Which kind of makes sense because again we have this whole idea of like co-terminal angles, right? We can add or subtract two pi and we get the same value when we take cosine or sine of it. Okay. And so we could do another full period here if we wanted to, we could just start at two pi, add another two pi onto it. So go out another two pi, we'll be at four pi. Okay, and then find the halfway point and the quarter points here of those of that interval. 
Okay? And then we can expect to see, okay, well, cosine 5 pi over 2, that's coterminal to pi over 2, so we're going to get 0. Cosine 3 pi, that's coterminal to pi, so we'll have negative 1, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. Right? You can then kind of just use the pattern of the wave to help us here. And it kind of continues on, right? <coughs> All right, so questions on the basic sine or cosine graphs there. We'll worry about tangent, cotangent, cosecant, and secant later, next week. Okay, after break. So, all right, let's do a couple transformations here then. Right, why, now that we just learned that, let's talk about transforming. So um, let's consider something like y equals uh, 2 cosine of x. Okay. <coughs> And I'm going to make a little table here for this one. I won't worry about like doing the graph. I'll, I'm going to graph them back up here on their original pieces here. OK? So let's think. I'll kind of try to make it more obvious here. So we'll use that cosine we were just talking about. And again, for our x values, let's just pick the easy ones to evaluate. So let's do like 0. Let's do pi over 2. Let's do pi. Let's do 3 pi over 2. And let's do 2 pi. Because those kind of um, identified our zeros, our peaks, and our valleys for our wave, right? So if we have those, we kind of have like the extreme values of our waves, right? We have all the maximums, all the minimums, and all the zeros. <coughs> okay. So um, cosine of zero, right? We said was one. Cosine of pi over two is zero. Cosine of pi negative one. Cosine three pi over two is going to be zero again, and then cosine two pi is back to one. <clears throat> okay, so that's what we had when we had co just plain old cosine, right? That's what the values we had. But what's 2 cosine going to do to all those values? Double. Double them, right? Multiply them by 2 because we still have the cosine, so we'll still take cosine of 0, so we still get answer of 1, but then we have to double it, so times 2. So we'll get 2 there, all right? Um, we'll still take cosine of pi over 2, it's going to be 0, but then 0 times 2, oh, it's still 0, okay? Pi. Cosine pi is negative 1 times 2 will be negative 2, and so on and so forth, right? So we're just going to double all those y values there. <coughs> so how is it going to affect our graph here of cosine? What's this going to do to cosine? Yeah, it's going to get taller and slower, too, right? It's going to do a stretch or a dilation, right? Which that follows right in line with every other transformation you've ever seen whenever you have your function and you throw a coefficient in front, right, like a positive 2, or a positive three, what does that do to your function? It dilates it by a vertical stretch, right? A vertical a vertical factor. Okay? Of course, if we wanted to make cosines way smaller, what kind of number would we throw in front of there? A fraction, like less than something less than one, right? Between zero and one. It's like one half or one third. Okay? So right, exactly right. What would what would um, a negative cosine of x do? What kind of transformation would that result in? Reflection over what? Not the y-axis. If we throw it in front of the cosine, it'd be over the x-axis, so it just flips it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. So all these transformations you know from earlier functions apply here. <coughs> okay, all those things apply here. Okay, when we affect that, let me just go ahead and graph this too. I'll do it in. I'll do it in green. Maybe that will contrast with the red. Okay. So again, at zero, we'll now be at two. So I'll kind of put, put a two up here. Okay, at pi over two, we'll still be at zero. At pi will be at negative 2, 3 pi over 2 at 0, 2 pi at 2, and so on and so forth. We can continue the pattern, too, if we wanted to. So 5 pi over 2 back at 0, 3 pi, negative 2, 7 pi over 2 back at 0, 4 pi back at 2. And so now, we can see there, just what we did, right? Has the period changed? No, it still is 2 pi in length. Okay, the period has not changed. All we've done is just stretch it. <clears throat> okay, all we've done is just kind of stretch the top and the bottom out some. So the zeros are still zeros, okay? Uh, and the shape still remains the same, but just we stretch it a little bit. Or maybe it's like I got the location of the relative max and min and stuff like that too. Okay? So there's like the graph of it right there. I think I need to continue this on. Odd infinitum. All right? Do you guys remember from physics, what do you call, um, what, what, what characteristic of the wave was affected here? What do we call that? When we change the height of the wave, that is, the height of the wave is also known as the 
Starts with an A. Amplitude. You got it. That's right. Okay. So this number here in front affects the amplitude. Okay. So the amplitude. Okay, is um, always positive. Bless you. The wavelength stays the same. Exactly right. And we'll talk about adjusting the wavelength in just a second here. Okay. The wavelength is always positive, so it is equal to the absolute value of a, where y equals a sine x or y equals a cosine x. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Oops. You think of it as like the distance from the center of the wave. to the peak or valley or trough. I don't know what you use for like the bottom, but I guess I'll say peak or valley. Okay, Trough, you like trough? Yeah, I know. It, p people use either one there. So if you like trough, you can feel free to use trough. Okay, so it's this from the center of the wave to the peak or valley. So it is not, right, the amplitude is not a measure of the bottom point to the highest point. There is a name for that. And I can't think of what it's called right now. But there is a name for What's that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there is a name for like the 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 distance from the from the peak of a wave down to its like lowest point too. I forget what it's called though. I think it's a sailing term. Or you see it, I don't know. They use they tend to use that to describe waves when you're like out on the ocean and stuff like that. Instead of the amplitude. Because that tends to matter more if you're in the boat and you're at the bottom of that drop and you see the wave up above you there. You care more about like how far you are from the top of the wave there in the center. Okay, but keep in mind here the amplitude is always positive. So if you see a negative two cosine x there, that negative is important. It flips the function, right? But it doesn't. The amplitude is still just two, okay? Because we think about it as a distance. So you would only want to describe it as a positive two amplitude. Okay. <coughs> Questions on any of that? Press and troughs. Okay, there you go. Yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> All right, so then one other thing we're going to look at here, bless you, bless you. All right, is the period. Okay, and we're going to talk about a period um, stretch or shrink. We'll talk about a period shift, which is like moving things left and right. But for right now, we're just going to worry about stretching or shrinking the period. So you can think of it like a horizontal, or you, if you want to think of it this way, a horizontal stretch slash shrink. Okay. Now, uh, Mr. Thompson may have shown you kind of like one way to calculate this, because I know you guys did transformations and stuff like that. Pardon me, I'm sorry. You did do transformations, right, in Thompson's class? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to show you a thing, something that I think makes it a little bit easier to calculate. Okay. Um, sorry. Wave height is what it's called. Okay, wave height. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, wave height. Okay. Thank you for looking that up. Um, so I'm going to show you a little something easier. First of all, how do we even know if we're going to have a period stretch or shrink? Well, we're going to have this a number in front of our x, but inside of our sine or cosine there. Okay, so like that little B right there, that indicates a horizontal stretch or shrink. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, right? Throw a number in front of the function, like the A is, that's a vertical stretch or shrink. Throw a number in front of the X term, our independent variable, that's a horizontal stretch or shrink. Okay, so those coefficients kind of indicate stretches and shrinks. What we're going to do is to figure out how we stretch or shrink here. We're going to start with a typical period. So the typical period for sine or cosine, right, kind of the stereotypical period, is between 0 and 2 pi. Right? That's kind of like our normal vanilla sine and cosine period. Right? Which really does vanilla a disservice, because vanilla is a flavor unto itself. But 
that's what we use for plain, right, sometimes. I guess there is a plain flavor, but you get the idea. Okay. <clears throat> All right, we're going to take that Bx, whatever it is, and put it between, in an inequality, between our typical period, our starting, our kind of initial period there, and we'll just solve for x, get the x by itself. So we're going to kind of undo the transformation to x here. So we'll divide both sides by b. We'll end up with 0 here, and then 2 pi over b. Okay, and so that will then give us our new period. Okay, so we'll no longer have the period between 0 and 2 pi. Instead, it'll be between 0 and 2 pi over b, whatever that happens to be. Okay, so let's do y equals sine of x over 2. <clears throat> okay, and I'll do something similar here. I'm going to do a horizontal table, though, instead of a, a vertical table like I did. Okay, so again, we'll do... Um, Sine of x, I'll compare it to, and then I'll compare it to sine of x over 2, right? Because we just did sine of x on the back, on the, on the other page over there, earlier problem. <clears throat> okay, and again, let's just use some easy values for x. So 0 pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. Okay, if you want to get more points than this, that is fine, but I would like these points bare minimum, okay, when it comes to a problem like a problem like this. Okay? So in other words, starting point of your period, stopping point of your period, and then the halfway point and the quarter points. That'll be a good way to go. Okay. So again, sine of zero, zero. Sine of pi over two, one. Sine of pi, zero, and then negative one, and then back to zero there. Okay. Now when I plug in 0 for x here, for the, for the second function, 0, I'm going to have to take that 0 and divide it by 2. Well, what's 0 divided by 2? 0, right? And what's sine of 0? <laughs> sine of 0 is 0. OK, so we're still at 0 there. Very good. All right, let's plug in pi over 2. Pi over 2 divided by 2 is pi over 4. What's sine of pi over 4? We know it. Root 2 over 2. Okay? Which is approximately 0 0.7. If you don't recall, we did it. I talked about that earlier, but that's okay if you don't. Okay? Let's talk about pi. All right? Plug in pi. Pi divided by 2. Pi over 2, right? What's sine of pi over 2? Yes. What is sine of pi over 2? It's at 90 degrees, right? Y, at, y coordinate, so it's going to be 1. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sine of 3 pi over 2. Oh, but we're not going to do It's 3 pi over 2 divided by 2, so it's now 3 pi over 4. What's sine of 3 pi over 4? It's going to be that root 2 over 2 again, which again is approximately 0 0.7. Okay, And what is sine of, well, again, 2 pi divided by 2 is pi. What's sine of pi? Sine of pi is zero, 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 zero. Right, because we're plugging in 2 pi. So 2 pi divided by 2 would be pi. Sine of pi then is zero. OK, so interesting. So let's see what happens here with this. All right, so again, I'll start my y-axis. My amplitude of this is just 1. So again, I know my highest high is going to be 1. My lowest low will be negative 1 there, because that's my amplitude. Right, so it's the highest I'm going to go is 1. The, highest, the lowest I'll go is negative 1. And then I'll go ahead and plot in these points. So let's see. I'll put in here's pi. And I'll do 2 pi. And I'll do the quarter points, pi over 2, and then 3 pi over 2. OK. And so let's see here. For sine, again, sine's easy to see. I'll do sine in black here. And then I'll do the other one in red. Sine's easy to see. We did it already. Okay, there it is. And then here's sine of x over 2. I'll do that in red. Okay, so we still have 0, 0. At pi over 2, we're at root 2 over 2, so that's like 0.7. So it's like not quite 3 quarters, so maybe something like this. 
And then for, again, sine of x over 2 at pi, we're at 1. 3 pi over 2, we're back to that 0 0.7. So I'll try and do it the same height there, roughly. And then 2 pi, when we're back at 0. So we have this. So the sine of x over 2, what kind of transformation was it? Was it a stretch or a shrink? It was a stretch, right, by a factor of 2. Right? We stretched out twice as long. Mm -hmm. Yep, the wavelength is wider now. Okay. In fact, yeah, what is one full period going to be here? What will the length of one full period be? 4 pi as opposed to 2 pi, right? And so we can see that calculation here by just doing what I said with the inequality there, right? So take, again, your normal period between 0 and 2 pi. Put inside of it, though, put between it that x over 2, okay? Solve for x here by multiplying both sides by 2, and we get 0 is less than or equal to x is less than 4 pi. So our new full period, our new full period is now between 0 and 4 pi. Okay, and so if we wanted to, we could extend out our x-axis here and go out to 4 pi. Okay, like so. <clears throat> and we can just kind of follow the pattern here, right? At pi we had 1, so at 3 pi we'll have negative 1, and then at 4 pi we'll be back to 0. I normally have you graph at least one full period, but sometimes I'll have you do two full periods. Or sometimes I'll ask for two full periods. <coughs> so. so you can see here, again, the idea that we have in one full period of the sine of x over 2, we fit two full periods of just plain old sine of x. So my recommendation to you, what should you do here, right? So when it comes to graphing, okay, um, you know, um, how would I say this? So at least for right now, what we know. So graphing tips, I guess I'll give you guys here. Okay, tip one, okay. Use the amplitude to label your y-axis, right? The amplitude is going to determine how high or how low your wave is, <coughs> OK? So if your amplitude's got a 2, you need, you'll need 2 on the y-axis and a negative 2 on the lower part of the y-axis, right? Negative 2 to 2, right? If, your amplitude, if you have a 1 half in front of your function, then you'll need highest point is 1 half, lowest point is negative 1 half kind of thing, OK? Second, um, find your period slash period length. using 0 less than bx less than, oops, I put less than equal to there. Sorry, 0 less than equal to bx less than 2 pi, and solving for x. OK? So find your period slash period length using that in inequality I told you about, and solve for x. OK? Plot. The starting point, ending point, midpoint, and quarter points of the interval. Okay? So once you get your new period, if it's transformed, plot the starting point of that period, so that's the left end point, right? Plot the ending point, that's the right end point of your interval there. Plot the midpoint, so what's halfway between you know, your starting and stopping point, and then the quarter points, what's half the halves, okay? And then use those to find the peaks and valleys, okay? Um, Right, 
and then connect the dots. Exactly right. Step five, enjoy your work. OK. So definitely would recommend that you get you know some practice in with this, OK, for sure. Um, I didn't leave you a whole lot of time here, but I do have the assignment uh, um, on Google Classroom for you as we speak, OK? If you'd like to come in for set and work on this, you know, just to be around, you know, so you can ask questions.